And so she's very kindly come here tonight to tell us about Pope Benedict XVI and his great contribution to the church. Thanks, John. Um, I think that, that the reason why some people think I'm clever is simply that I've made a kind of kind of academic career, unintentionally, out of just writing about Pope Benedict's side of this. And when you, when you quote Pope Benedict, people think, oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> and so um, it, it really helps to, to be an authority on someone else who's brilliant, because it makes you look very good. What I intend to do is to, um, to sort of give an overview, and then we can open it up for a QA. and a so, I think probably different people will have different interests in the, the ideas of Benedict. So I'll give a general overview, then, then we can just have a, have a chat about him. So Joseph Ratzinger was born in 1927, the youngest of three children to a police chief and his wife, who had worked as a cook before her marriage. The family was devoutly Catholic. His father retired early to avoid having to enforce Nazi regulations, and a young Joseph did serve in the army during the Second World War, but he never so much as fired a shot. In 1946, sort of the very first year after the end of the Second World War, he entered the seminary for the Archdiocese of Munich, along with his older brother Georg. Fellow students distinguish the pair by the names organ rats and bucher rats, that is the organ playing ratzinger and the bookish ratzinger. Joseph completed both his doctorate and his habilitation schrift, which is a second dissertation that's required in German universities in order to teach, under the supervision of Gottlieb Sönchen whom he described as both a radical thinker and a radical believer. Sergeant had a particular interest in the border zones between philosophy and theology, and this interest is, in, is reflected in Ratzinger's many articles and lectures on the relationship between faith and reason. That's significant because you'll notice in most universities there's a department of philosophy and a separate department of theology and people tend to be classified either as philosophers or theologians. But Sörnchen was one of those people uh, in that interwar German generation who wanted to integrate the two, and he actually uh, edited a whole series of books on the border zones between philosophy and theology, and then this, this you see um, very strongly in the works of Joseph Ratzinger, a, more, a great desire to integrate faith and reason. During these student years, Romano Guardini was also teaching at the University of Munich, and Ratzinger was one of many German Catholics of his generation inspired by Guardini. Guardini emphasised that Christianity was primarily about an encounter with Christ and the other persons of the Holy Trinity. It was not primarily an ethical system, as the 18th century German philosopher Immanuel Kant tried to reduce it. So that's another important theme that comes up in the theology of Benedict that Christianity is all about a personal relationship with the Holy Trinity. And there is an ethical system that goes with being a Christian, but it's not the primary thing, it's something secondary to that personal relationship. At the tender age of 35, Ratzinger attended the Second Vatican Council as a theological advisor to Cardinal Friends of Cologne where he influenced the development of the documents Lumen Gentium and De Verbum, that is, the documents on ecclesiology and uh, scripture, tradition, and revelation. In those years, Ratzinger was regarded as an agent for change because he was much more Augustinian than neo scholastic. By the early 1970s, however, those theologians who had opposed the dominance of neo scholasticism during the Second Vatican Council, split into two camps. One camp, under the leadership of theologians such as Hans Kuhn and Edward Skilovex, 
published in the journal Conchilium. While Ratzinger, having initially been on the board of Conchilium, resigned, and together with Henri de Lubach and Hans Ernst von Balthasar, founded the journal Communio in 1972. The foundation of Communio followed on the, on the success of Ratzinger's book, Introduction to Christianity. It was a bestseller despite the fact that it is a rather theologically dense book for an introduction. In fact, if you're looking for an introduction to Ratzinger's theology, that's probably the last book I would recommend that you read. After holding professorships at German universities, he was appointed the Archbishop of Munich in 1977 and made a cardinal by Pope Paul VI. From 1981 until his election to the papacy in 2005, he was the prefect for the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. In 2013, he became the first pontiff for centuries to resign and then retired to a monastery for a decade of prayer before his death on the very last day of 2022. From the time he joined the seminary and was known as Bukha Raps, the bookish rap singer, until his death he was an intellectual leader. He was not a political activist or an organiser or an entrepreneur and certainly not a bureaucrat or a politician but a man with a very deep prayer life and a gift for scholarship, a love of music and of solemn liturgy and of cats. He particularly liked animals, I think, but especially cats. His personality type was such that one wonders why he did not pursue the vocation of a Benedictine monk. There are so many great Benedictine monasteries dotted along the rivers of Germany and Austria and I think he would have been very much at home in many of those monasteries. Any resume of Joseph Ratzinger's theological achievements would need to include that while serving as a peritus, that is a theological advisor, at the Second Vatican Council, he made significant contributions to both Dave Verben, the dogmatic constitution of divine revelation, as well as sections of Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution on the church. As prefect for the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith during the pontificate of John Paul II, he released the document's instruction on certain aspects of the theology of liberation in 1984 and instruction on Christian freedom and liberation in 1986. These two documents sought to address the theological crisis created by various forms of liberation theology popular in Latin America. He also promulgated numerous documents on sexual and bioethical issues. As chairman of the Pontifical Biblical Commission, he presided over the drafting of two landmark documents. The Interpretation of the Bible in the Church, published in 1993, and the Jewish people and their sacred scriptures in the Christian Bible, published in 2002. The first of these is the first place to go to acquire a summary of the Church's teaching on the principles governing scriptural interpretation, while the second is the first place to go to acquire an understanding of the relationship between the Old and the New Testaments. During the pontificate of St. John Paul II, Cardinal Ratzinger, as he was, also played a major role in the composition of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, promulgated in 1992, brokered the joint declaration on justification with members of the Lutheran World Federation in 1999, and released the declaration Dominus Jesus in the year 2000. The latter was designed to clear up ambiguous matters in the territories of ecclesiology, ecumenism, and interfaith dialogue. As Pope Benedict, he issued three encyclicals, the first on the theological virtue of love, the second on the theological virtue of hope, and the third on the relationship of charity and truth. A fourth encyclical on the theological virtue of faith was drafted by Benedict 
but not released uh, before the end of his papacy, and it later appeared under the name of Francis, probably with a few amendments made by Pope Francis, but substantially the document was drafted by, Rat by Ratzinger and Benedict. Benedict also issued four apostolic exhortations, Sacramentum Caritatis in 2007, which took up themes in his pre-papal works on, on liturgy, Verbum Domini in 2010, which focused on Christology and scripture, and then uh, there were two more documents, one on the church in Africa and one on the situation of the church in the Middle East. In addition to all these magisterial documents, he published well over 60 books and numerous shorter articles, including his exegetical books on Jesus of Nazareth, released during his pontificate. More specifically, what makes this body of work so valuable is that Ratzinger slash Benedict was a man who understood the theological crises of the last four centuries. Many of these crises have their origins in German philosophy, theology, and social theory. And while many lost their faith trying to nav navigate their way through these waters, Ratzinger had the intellectual formation to understand the arguments and the intellectual strength to reply to them. He never lost the faith of his childhood. This requires various gifts of the Holy Spirit but especially the gift of piety. The expression generation of 68, or in French, soixante huit ans, has become academic shorthand for the generation born at the end of the Second World War, who were young adults and university students in the late 1960s. The intellectual elite of this generation was decidedly hostile toward Christianity, and many Catholics of this generation were swept along in the tide. Indeed, the historian Gerd Rainer Horn, who publishes with Oxford University Press, has pointed out that many of the loudest student protest leaders of this generation were, in fact, former Catholic seminarians or candidates for Protestant ministries. It's a really fascinating sociological fact. You know, when you think about the year 1968, you think about the protests in Paris, uh, in uh, Germany, and uh, other parts of Europe. The fact is that many of those leaders had been seminarians or they had been uh, students for the Protestant ministries. Hon's macro-level thesis is that a utopian, messianic dimension of Catholicism overlapped with the secular ideals of the generation of the 1960s. Messianic Catholicism and Marxism captured the imagination of a generation and these twin forces reinforced each other. The ground for this was prepared by the conciliar call to read the signs of the times and to be open to the world. Exhortations that were, according to Ratzinger, later given sociological rather than theological interpretations. Theologians like Johann Baptist Metz in Germany linked the concepts of salvation and liberation, spawning the liberation theology movement in Latin America. While theologians like Edward Skillebeks in Holland and Belgium set about correlating the faith to elements of the zeitgeist or what they called the culture of modernity. The end result was that in the 1970s, the ideas of building the kingdom of God morphed into the project of working for various types of minority liberation movements. And Christianity itself, in some of these countries where these ideas were influential, underwent a secularization process, morphing into the parody of celebrity philanthropy as it has become in some circles today. Ratzinger slash Benedict stood opposed to these various social and theological trends and argued that the faith does not change from one generation to the next. Pastoral crises may lead to a deepening of the understanding of the faith 
and hence the development of doctrine and of the church's theological tradition. But he argued that there can be no recasting of the deposit of faith. Even popes, he insisted, are circumscribed by both scripture and tradition. He described the papacy as being more like a constitutional than an absolute monarchy. Constitutional monarchs like our own king are fettered in the exercise of their powers by constitutional conventions. In the case of the Petrine office, the conventions are the teachings of Christ found in scripture and the tradition of the church. Today, the younger generations of Catholics have a very different perspective from those of the generation of 1968. Many go to Ratzinger's works for their foundational theological principles. Usually when ecclesial leaders retire or die, their power to influence ecclesial affairs is diminished. However, in the case of Ratzinger Benedict, his power, so to speak, is the potency of his intellectual legacy. This will continue for as long as people have access to his books. And one of the merits of his books is that anyone who has been properly catechised can follow them. This includes many lay Catholics who are young professionals trying to raise families in a postmodern culture where people no longer believe in reason or in truth. In summary, Joseph Ratzinger Benedict XVI was a scholar pope. His leadership style was that of a teacher or a confessor of the faith. The gift he brought to the church was an extensive knowledge of the Catholic intellectual tradition, along with an immersion in modern German philosophy. The latter has been the source of both the best and the worst of contemporary philosophy, viewed from a Christian perspective. On the one side, there are philosophers like Peter Wurst, great Catholic philosopher, St. Benedict, uh, sorry, St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, otherwise known as Edith Stein, another great Catholic philosopher and martyr, the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber, uh, the Catholic philosopher Dietrich von Hildebrand, the great Jesuit philosopher Alfred Delp, and the lay uh, philosopher Robert Speyman, all absolute heroes of the Catholic intellectual tradition, along with Buber uh, as the Jewish uh, philosopher in that list. And Edith Stein, of course, was uh, a Jew who became a Catholic, but always saw herself as, as having fulfilled the Jewish tradition, not so much uh, surpassed it, but fulfilled it. They're all on the one side, and then on the other side, you have characters like Emmanuel Kant, Karl Marx, Friedrich Nietzsche, and the very ambivalent Martin Heidegger. It's impossible to understand the current culture wars without being across the works of Karl Marx, uh, Emmanuel Kant, Friedrich Nietzsche, and Heidegger, and their disciples. While the formulation of a Christian response to such philosophers requires something more than a knowledge of the patristics and the scholastics, however valuable that may be. It requires an understanding of personalist philosophy as well. And Ratzinger had it all. He, had, he was across all of these different traditions. He was the great church doctor of the 20th century and in many ways the heir to St. John Henry Newman, whom he beatified and who was the great church doctor of the 19th century. When new generations of scholars read Ratzinger, they will find that he left behind a treasury of insights into fundamental theology, liturgical theology, ecclesiology, scriptural hermeneutics, eschatology, Christology, and theological anthropology. He also knew and loved the high culture of Christian Europe its music, its architecture and literature. And he will no doubt be viewed as one of the great representatives of that culture, which is itself a fusion of the cultural gifts of the Jews, of the classical Greeks and Romans, and of Christian revelation. 
I want now to, to conclude by first citing four of my favourite quotations from Ratzinger and Benedict, and finally uh, reciting for you a short poem he wrote for a child in one of his religious education classes. But the four quotations I want to cite relate to the subject of what is needed in the church at the moment. And this is what he said. Saints reformed the church in depth, not by working up plans for new structures, but by reforming themselves. What the church needs in order to respond to the needs of man in every age is holiness, not management. And the second quotation, the saints were all people of imagination. They were not functionaries of apparatuses. Thirdly, he said, I have said very often that I think we have too much bureaucracy. Therefore, it will be necessary to simplify things. Everything should not take place by way of committees. There must be personal encounters. And finally, Paul was effective, that is saying Paul was effective, not because of his brilliant rhetoric and his sophisticated strategies, but rather because he exerted himself and he left himself vulnerable in the service of the gospel. So I think that's interesting in the, in the context of many of the discussions today, that what is required is more holiness, um, not new committees, structures, processes, protocols, general policy monking. And finally, this beautiful poem he, he wrote for a child who handed him her autograph when, when he was teaching in her religion, religious education class. And this is what he wrote in, um, in 1959. However the winds blow, you should stand against them. When the world falls apart, your brave heart may not despair. Without the heart's bravery, which has the courage to withstand unshakably the spirits of the time and the masses, we cannot find the way to God and the true way of our Lord. Which I think is, is beautiful. It's sort of saying um, the true way to the Lord, you know, it's, you have to, in many cases, stand against uh, whatever the spirits of the time are telling you, whatever is the wisdom of the masses of the time. You have to stand against them if the world is, quote, falling apart. He wrote those words in 1959. So that's my, that's my overview for you, but now um, you're very welcome to ask questions and then in that way I can perhaps talk about some aspects of Ratzinger's thought in greater depth. Thank you. Um, I met him on three occasions, and uh, the first time was at a conference, and he couldn't believe that anyone would actually come all the way from Australia to Rome to attend the conference. You know, he, his thought was just like, oh, you poor thing, <laughs> um, you've endured that long haul flight. Um, on another occasion, it was one of those uh, situations in Rome where people are brought forward to kiss the ring of the Pope and be photographed with him and have you know, 10 seconds of conversation with him. And I think I managed to say something like, thank you for being so courageous and so faithful to the tradition, something like that. Um, and then the third time it was when I received the Ratzinger Prize, and in my year, uh, there were four of us. Normally there are only two, but because of COVID, my year got held up, and then uh, we joined the, the two recipients of the prize the following year. So four of us were taken to his monastery uh, in the Garden of, of the Vatican, 
uh, and we had one hour of conversation with him. And he was still, so that would have been 2021, November 2021, he was still intellectually as sharp as a tank. And I've, I've, we, each one of us had to talk to him about our academic work. And I told him that I was working on editing a rats in a lexicon. Uh, this is a, a collection of essays by 72 different scholars around the world on Ratzinger's theology. And I knew that he knew about it because we had invited him to write a preface. And when he wrote the preface, he made a whole lot of the fact that there were 72 scholars, okay? Because of the Septuagint being composed allegedly by 70 or 72 people, and all of us had missed that. The number 72 had been totally lost on us as a significant theological number. We just thought, you know, how many people do we have? And we, we counted and we got 72. So that we told him that in our letter uh, requesting a preface. So we get this lovely preface back from him giving a theological reflection on the importance of the number 72. And we think, oh my God, we better check that there are 72 contributors. And we checked and we had only 71. So then we asked uh, Professor Hanna-Barbara Gale Felkowitz, who's one of the great heroes of the, the church in Germany. She's a, a scholar, uh, expert on the thought of Romano Guardini wonderful lady and uh, so we invited her to to contribute something and she just happened to be one of the, the four people in the room at the time so we all had this great laugh about you know theologians not being able to count and the trouble the embarrassment and then how we had to get professor Gail Felkowitz to become our number 72 and, and he loved all of that and Professor Gail Falkowitz told him that she had somehow managed to obtain <coughs> Romano Guardini's rosary beads. And his eyes just lit up and it was like she had a toy he would love to have. You know? His love for Guardini was, was palpable. So it was a really lovely um, meeting. And of course, at the end, we all knelt down and, and kissed his ring. And it was, it was very, very moving. Yeah, I've also, I must say, I've also met his cat, and I've been photographed with his cat. Oh. The cat's name is Zorro, so that, that's also something that happened, no, but not on that occasion. Yes? Thank you so much for your talk. Um, what was so inspiring to Benedict about God in his mm -hmm. Why did yeah. he love him so much? Um, Guardini was a, a, an interesting character. Um, he was the leader of the German Catholic Youth Movement for, for a very long time. The, the German Catholic Youth Movement was called Quickborn, and Guardini was a very charismatic figure. He, he great, gave great homilies, and he was wonderful at explaining the meaning of the faith you know, he, and, and helping people to understand on a very concrete level uh, what it means to be in a personal relationship with the Trinity. And he, he inspired you know, so many people through the German Catholic Youth Movement. But then when the Nazis um, recognised the influence that he had, uh, they tried to take over the movement, and so he uh, disbanded it. He kind of scuttled it, so they couldn't take control of it. He then ended up ultimately at the University of Munich, where he had not he had a professorial chair, but it wasn't in philosophy or theology, but in something called the Catholic worldview, and he would integrate philosophy and theology and explain how the Catholic intellectual tradition is an integration of these two areas of what we know from Revelation, 
and uh, the, you know, what we know from the great tradition of philosophy that comes out of Greece. Uh, so he was, he was able to unpack all of that uh, in a way that was very intellectually engaging. So students would go just to hear him, you know, not because they had to, to listen to him, but because he was so intellectually engaging. And Ratzinger, when he was a young student, would, would just go along to listen to Guardini. And students would not only go to his lectures, but he would say mass um, at the church of St. Ludwig, uh, near the University of Munich. And they would go to hear his homilies as well. So, you know, a great homilist, a great public speaker, um, someone who was deeply holy and able to to inspire people. Yeah. Uh, David, now this will probably be a question I won't be able to answer. This chap, this chap knows more about aspects of Ratzinger than I do, but anyway. Well, we, we learn things all the time. And I discovered something that I know you'll know about, but I just discovered it you know, in the last six months. Mm -hmm. And your 1959 poem, I think, fits into this. Yeah. Because in 1958 he published that essay on the new pagans in the church. Yes. And that to me said very strongly mm. there was no post Vatican II change in Ratzinger. Yes. Who he was in 1968 was who he was in 1958. Yes. Yeah. And I'll throw in the Cardinal Friends thing as well, 61. Oh, yes. Just putting that to you and asking you to say something on that essay, and it's, it's, it was 10 years before 68, mm -hmm. and he saw it already. Yeah. Yeah. So you, well, you, there, there are two issues. Well, one issue that David sort of alluded to is in the, in the Ratzinger studies, so if you read like biographies of Ratzinger, there's one group of people who say uh, Ratzinger never changed his theological spots. And then there are other, there's this other camp who said, yes, he did. He was a kind of radical at the Second Vatican Council, and then he became all conservative um, in the late 1960s. And the, the narrative, so to speak, that he changed his spots was spun largely by Hans Kuhn. And Ratzinger always disagreed with this narrative, and he said, I never changed the culture around me changed. Um, so in, in the early 1960s, being an Augustinian rather than being a Thomist or a Swaragian Thomist uh, was quite different. Um, it, it wasn't the sort of dominant theological tradition at that moment. But by the late 1960s, being an Augustinian is regarded as really conservative when people are hopping on board with, say, Marxism. You know. So the culture around had changed. And, and Ratzinger's position was that, that he did not ever change his theological spots. And the point that I think David is making is that Further evidence for the Ratzinger never changed his theological spots thesis is this essay in 1958 where he talks about the new pagans in the church. And he's talking about people who have been baptized but not catechized. So people who, who go along because you know their parents take them for baptism, but um, there's no intellectual or spiritual formation to follow that up. And, and so you end up with the, the problem we have in some countries, especially the formerly Christian countries of Europe, where nominally people can all say, yeah, yeah, you know, I was baptised, I'm a Catholic or whatever. Um, but they really have no faith. And uh, Ratzinger was, was acutely aware of that, even in the late 1950s, and talking about the problems of secular culture and processes of secularization in the late 1950s and predicting uh, that the, the church would end up being much smaller, that there would be fewer believers, but he thought that there would be, that the fewer believers would be more faithful 
because they would have had to really think about why they ought to be a believer rather than simply um, just sort of going along with the culture once the culture was no longer fundamentally Christian. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He's written a number of books on the liturgy, and some are more popular than others. Um, he, I, I love some of the expressions uh, he has in some of the more popular ones, like he's critical of what he calls parish tea party liturgies, um, and he's critical of what he calls pastoral pragmatism. You know, the idea that if people like country and western music, then you have to have country and western music in the liturgy. That's, that's what he understands by pastoral pragmatism. He's critical of those things. Um, the, the, most, the, the book which is probably the most uh, academic is his book, The Spirit of the Liturgy, and his apostolic exhortation, uh, Sacramentum Caritatis. I would regard those two publications as his most important liturgical publications. His attitude to the liturgical changes was he thought it would be good to have the scripture readings in the vernacular, but that's about all he would have changed. Um, he, he thinks that it's good to keep uh, the Kyrie in Greek the Sanctus, the Gloria, the Credo, all in Latin. So, you know, in, in his ideal world, um, different countries would have different scriptural readings in the, the language of the country, but otherwise um, there would be like a common liturgy uh, using, using Latin and for the Kyrie, of course, Greek. Um, his he also had the belief that, you, that it's perfectly okay to have more than one rite in operation, providing, any, providing that any given rite could trace itself uh, to the apostolic era. Okay, so there are a number of rites in play, uh, and there are all those unit rites. You know, um, different, the different unit churches have their own liturgical languages, he doesn't see anything wrong with that. He's not a bureaucrat. He doesn't think that there's anything virtuous about uniformity. Um, so he says, so long as the right is of apostolic prominence and not something cooked up by a liturgy committee last week, then, it, then it's okay. Um, that was his general position. So his attitude to the what he called the extraordinary form was that it had no theological defects, um, it was perfectly legitimate. Uh, it had been replaced because Paul VI was convinced that what we now call the Novus Ordo or New Liturgy would be more popular with so-called modern man. Uh, there's actually a homily by Paul VI that was published in the Servitore Romano after the change where he says these things, you know, we're parting with the speech of Christian centuries, you know, we're entering the precincts of profane utterance, statements like that, but says it's necessary because modern man likes plain language, and so we have to have a liturgy with plain language. And that's all a sociological judgment. There's nothing theological about it. And, of course, a lot of people just said, well, we're not modern men, you know, um, in a sociological sense. So he says in the spirit of the liturgy that people who preferred the extraordinary form or the tridentine rite, whatever one wants to call it, that they had been treated like lepers and that this was completely unjust. And so... Um, on the 7th of July 2007, we get Samorum Pontificum. And his hope was that the, the two liturgies would perhaps start to in, exercise an influence over each other. Yeah. And he, 
he was he was understanding about the fact that in some parts of the world the Novus Ordo had turned, been turned into a parish tea party liturgy. And he understood that because of that, there were these sort of waves of people saying we prefer what he called the extraordinary form. Yeah, is that yeah. okay? Yeah. Hi, Tracy. Um, just you talk about plain language and, and um, um, rats are going to be accused of you know, the deep theological awareness brilliance, but um, he also was able to touch with, for example, would you speak on the uh, the Jesus series? Yeah. Where he spoke on the, the life of Christ in, in such a way that it was really accessible. Absolutely. Um, I said earlier that I would not, if, if you were not um, already, say, a student of theology or philosophy, I wouldn't read his introduction to Christianity as the first book. Because in that book, he's really having arguments with German philosophers. Uh, German philosophers who have attacked Christianity, and he's, he's punching them up. Uh, but the Jesus of Nazareth trilogy, he writes uh, as Pope. And those books are absolutely beautiful. Uh, anyone, you know, I think anyone who's in secondary school could pick up those books and read them and understand them. And in those books he unpacks the scriptures in a scholarly way, but a very accessible scholarly way. And I think he makes, he makes the whole Christian um, tradition and, you know, the history of the life of Christ uh, something that is uh, much more concrete. You know, he, he it just he presents it in a way that makes it sound new and true. You know, you read it and you think, yes, that's I see how these bits fit together, and it helps to improve, strengthen one's faith. So, you know, if if you were going to read only three Rand Singer books, I I would read the the. Um, Jesus of Nazareth trilogy. Yeah. Yes. So, a question on Pope Benedict. Um, he wrote extensively. Yes. You know, your, your talk has been very expressive. Especially when you're saying that beauty that works mm -hmm. and the love you know, that can generate. And I love um, to hear your side of this perception of beauty and the mm -hmm. importance of it. Yeah. Um, in Sacrament of Caritatis, he says that everything uh, pertaining to the liturgy must be marked by beauty. You know, he, he, he is totally opposed to dumbing things down to the level of the people, so-called. Uh, everything has to be done in such a way that it is, you know, the best music, the best art, the most beautiful everything that, that can be achieved. In philosophy and theology we talk about the transcendental properties of being and these are truth, goodness, beauty and unity. And some Protestant traditions think that um, beauty snuck into the Christian faith through Augustine's love of Plato and the Greeks, and that this was a deformation of the Christian tradition, and beauty's got nothing to do with it. You get, in some dimensions of Calvinism, you get that kind of mentality. But the Catholic tradition has always been very strongly affirming of the importance of the transcendental of beauty. And it's strongest, I think, in the works of St. Augustine uh, and St. Bonaventure and St. John Henry Newman and Benedict. If, you know, in those four, it is really very, very strong. <coughs> and uh, people who write about spirituality say that some people are attracted to Christianity by the beauty of the faith both intellectual beauty and the, the beauty of the practice of the faith. Others are, are attracted to Christianity because of its reasonableness, um, and others because of the goodness it generates. So different people are attracted to different transcendentals, but 
all of us are really attracted to all of them. But, but different people will have a kind of primary attraction. And some theologians argue that the majority of people will be influenced more by beauty than by truth or goodness or unity. Whatever you make of that judgment, so to speak, um, Ratzinger was very much in that tradition. Uh, he really thought that the beauty that Christianity has generated is one of the strongest proofs of its truth. Um, and he's, you know, there are some really beautiful passages in him about about beauty. Is that? Yeah. Okay. And, and the footnote is, of course, that his, um, his mentor, one of his mentors, one of, one, one of the people who influenced him, Hans Urs von Balthasar, was strongly of the view that, that beauty is important. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit more about Ratzinger's logic and argument that faith and reason are not opposed to each other? Mm -hmm. I know it's a big subject. Yeah. I mean, you wrote a lot, but can you press it down? Yeah. Well, I think in, in the German intellectual tradition, uh, there's, there's a strong attack on rationality in some aspects of Lutheranism, not all aspects of Lutheranism, but there's, you know, there's an attitude that comes with the Reformation that Catholics have sort of got more excited about philosophy than about Christ, you know, sort of putting it in a kind of caricatured way. So there's a, there's a start of a, a criticism of reason, um, and that comes with criticisms of late scholasticism, which is highly rationalistic. And, and, and so that's the Reformation wave. And then in the 18th century, there's another attack where Immanuel Kant decides that, that reason and faith need to be separated. You know? And so faith becomes something that's private and subjective. Uh, and then there's this search for pure reason. So the Enlightenment is a movement for the exaltation of so-called pure reason uncontaminated by faith. And Ratzinger calls this, um, in some places, an amputation of reason or a narrowing of the scope of reason. You know, he, he thinks that what we call empirical analysis is fair enough, you know, that there's nothing wrong with empirical analysis. But he does think that the range of reason is much broader and that um, our intellects were created in such a way that they are made for this encounter with revelation and should be open to that encounter with revelation. And the Catholic intellectual tradition at its best is an integrated vision of the work of reason and revelation. Um, uh, he says <coughs> in one of his essays, there's no such thing as pure reason. There's only impure reason and purified reason. <coughs> so that would be my short response. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, Christine. doing administrative work um, and sort of governance type work. 
uh, predominantly. Uh, sadly, I think, but that, that, that's the reality of, of the life of a lot of bishops. Um, they don't often have much time for, for scholarship. Ransinger, yeah, so he only had a short time as, as the Archbishop of Munich. Before that, he had professorial positions in theology, and then he's put in charge of every single academically important post in Rome. You know, so he's made, by John Paul II, he's made the, uh, what's it called, I'm not sure of the title, but he was put in charge of the Pontifical Biblical Commission. I think, I think it's chairman of the commission, but whatever the title is, he was in charge of the Pontifical Biblical Commission. Um, he was in charge of the International Theological Commission. He was prefect for the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, which is full of intellectual work. You know, that's what the, the CDF does. It, it analyzes um, works of theologians uh, to make sure that they're sound and makes decrees about theological errors. So it, it's all about intellectual work. Uh, so he had, he had the CDF, he, and he had the Pontifical Biblical Commission, um, and the ITC. So he was, he was really in charge of all the big intellectual posts in the life of the church. And then when he becomes the Pope, uh, his Wednesday audience addresses become highly popular because they're like little tutorials on the Catholic faith, and people flock to those Wednesday audience addresses to hear those things. So I think, you know, he was very much a scholar pope. Um, I'm told the last time we had one of those, uh, um, oh, was he a Benedict or a Gregory? I should know this. Um, but there was one around the time of the late Tudor era. He was apparently highly um, highly respected among some of the Protestant reformers and you know he was just a brilliant guy um, in the Petrine office. Um, I think his name was Lambertini, I think. I'm not a, I'm not a church historian, so don't quote me on that, but um, my name Prospero Lambertini comes to me, so. But anyway, there was, there was a great pope, um, a great intellectual pope in the history of the tradition. So Ratzinger Benedict hasn't been the only one. But he certainly is an outstanding scholar. You know, he was, um, at the turn of the millennium, he was invited to the Sorbonne to give a lecture that was called 2,000 Years After What? So that the Sorbonne now, you know, it's no longer like a Catholic university, uh, although it was initially, uh, but the Sorbonne's professors invited Ratzinger when he was still the cardinal to give that significant lecture at the turn of the millennium. Uh, he, you know, he spoke numerous languages. Um, he was completely at home with the scriptures. Uh, one. One member of the United Church once described Joseph Ratzinger to me as a good Lutheran lad. And, and I think by that, there was sort of a recognition that, that this guy actually understands the issues of the reformers and understands scripture. Yeah. So on so many different fronts, uh, he was just an intellectual gift to the church. and. Some people are really good at knowing what the church's intellectual tradition is. But Ratzinger knew not only that, but he knew the, you know, he knew, he understood all of these successive attacks on Christianity that have come out of Germany, you know, predominantly, uh, over the last 500 years. You, know, you could write a book saying uh, that Germany and Belgium are the two countries that have been responsible for the most attacks on Catholicism over the last 500 years. And still are. And still are. And, and Ratzinger is across all of that, you know, because he's brought up in Germany and 
The German universities are arguably the most rigorous many in the world, you know, to, to I think an almost neurotic degree. Uh, the, the kind of intensity of the intellectual formation that's required to be a professor at a German university. And so, you know, Ratzinger has all of, had all of that knowledge of the Greek philosophical tradition, uh, Roman letters, uh, patristic theology, medieval theology, and then the last 300 years of German philosophy. He had all of that plus the languages. So um, I think it's going to be a while before um, there's anyone like him again. I think the, the best parallel would be Newman in the 19th century. Uh, Newman had a, you know, an extensive knowledge of the whole, the whole world of um, contemporary scholarship English philosophy, uh, scripture, you know. So I think maybe we only get one of these times every century. But, you know, we never know. We might be blessed with some more of them. But, but certainly he is an outstanding figure. And what I think is now happening with, with works like the Ratzinger Lexicon, which is being published in six different languages, it will mean that Catholics like all of you, seminarians, priests, if they want to know about um, some, some special subject, like what do we understand by the concept of the people of God, you can just flip across to P for people of God, and then you get a 4,000 word essay on what Ratzinger said about the people of God concept. You know. So the Ratzinger lexicon will be a little bit like a catechism of the ideas of Joseph Ratzinger. Um, but there are many other things happening uh, to publicise Ratzinger's works and to make them more accessible to lay people. So I think, you know, I think his, his legacy will be uh, the way in which his academic work continues to provide for the intellectual and spiritual formation of generations to come. Much the way that, you know, today we still read John Henry Newman, uh, we still read Augustine, we still read Aquinas, and so on. Yes. Um, I understand Pope Benedict, before he passed away, his secretary had written a book. Do you yes. know much about the book? Is it, is it a tell-all book? Any I don't it? think it is. I have read it. Um, I thought it was a real disappointment as a tell-all book. Um, Prince Harry's spare is a better tell. <laughs> um, but uh, um, for me, one of the strangest things in that book, the, the tell-all book, was in one part, uh, Archbishop Ganswine mentions who was allowed to address Benedict with the German um, informal mode of address, do. DU rather than Z. You know. um, who was allowed to use do with Benedict? And it wasn't a list of the people who were intellectually closest to him. You know, he, he apparently Cardinal Casper could call him, could use the word, you know, do for you when referring when when you know having a conversation. So in, in English we only have one word for you, but in German there are two. Uh, and the, the formal is, you know, like it's a courtly way of relating to somebody. But somebody who was in your class at primary school, you could call them do. Uh, so it was interesting to see who could call him do and who couldn't. And in my mind, I couldn't make any sense of that, of, of who, was, who was allowed to do it and who wasn't. Because Casper, Casper was allowed to do it and Skoll wasn't. To me, that makes no sense, but that's the way it was. Now, but that is what I found interesting about that book. Mm. Yes. Um, at the start, you actually mentioned that his uh, main theology that Christianity is about a personal relationship to the Trinity. Mm. Um, obviously, 
Uh, Pope Benedict has brought that out in, uh, or Ratzinger has brought that out in his theology. Mm -hmm. But is there any insights you have about his um, actual personal relationship with Christ? Um, no, I don't. I don't have any kind of knowledge of his personal spirituality, uh, and that's because, yeah, he's not. You know, he hasn't written like a kind of um, account of that, and yeah. So I, I, I can't say that I know a lot about the, the spirituality of Joseph Ratzinger, apart from the fact that you know, he's very Benedictine. He's, he's interested in beauty, he loves the liturgy, he loves scripture, um, and he, he is interested in the person of Christ, strongly interested in the person of Christ. It is said of him that he's a bit weak on pneumatology, that if you look through his works, there's not a lot to be found on the Holy Spirit. That, that, that has been said of him. Uh, I think when it comes to this notion of Christianity as a personal relationship with the Trinity, where you get that unpacked most strongly is in the first three encyclicals Oh, in fact, may not have been the first three, but in the three encyclicals that St. John Paul II wrote on the Trinity. So he wrote Redemptor Hominis on the human person's relationship with Christ, and then there was Dominum and Vivificantum on the human person's relationship with the Holy Spirit, and uh, oh, what was the other one? Dives in Misericordia on the whole, on the human person's relationship with uh, God the Father. So if you want to to understand those relationships, I think John Paul II is the man to go to to get a really good understanding of those relationships. And which Benedict of course agreed with, but you know, it was John Paul II who wrote the Trinitarian suite. we know is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is really important for any kind of intellectual work. And, and Wurst would argue that the influence of Immanuel Kant in German <coughs> philosophy had undermined the role of piety in thought and this was a disaster. And that what you ended up with was um, a German academic culture that was hostile to piety and saw it as anti-intellectual, irrational, emotional. And Ratzinger just doesn't go down that track. Ratzinger never loses the piety of his childhood. Many people, including Wurst, uh, many of the, the really good Catholic scholars of the first half of the 20th century 
start out on a kind of Kantian trajectory, lose their faith, but somehow rediscover their faith. And Wust calls the rediscovery of faith the, the second naivety. You know, it's, you sort of lose your faith, but then come back to it, and you have a new form of naivety and piety. And there's a, a very amusing story of Wust sending his book on naivety and piety to Bishop Clemens August Graf von Gall, who was the Bishop of Munster. And he was a, a, just a lion of resistance to the Nazis. He was known as the Lion of Munster. And you know, he, would, he would do things like turn up at the police station to dob in the Gestapo for violating some Nazi regulation. You know, he, 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 had, he was just so courageous. Um, on one occasion, uh, some Nazis were heckling his homily and saying, what would a, a celibate man know about anything? And he responded, how dare you talk about our Führer in such a way? You know, and, and, and then on another occasion, the Gestapo come to arrest him. And so he dresses up in every bit of Episcopal regalia that he's entitled to wear, you know, with the long train of red silk, or not red, um, purple silk, trailing out the back. And the Gestapo fled. Um, and, and so he, he, he was just a hero of the German resistance to Nazism. And he gets this book from Wurst, you know, in the post, you know, here with a polite letter saying, you know, I've written this and thought you might enjoy it. And he writes back to Forst and says, thank you very much for the book, but, but I don't understand it because, you know, I've never lost my faith. I've never doubted my faith. <laughs> this is something I've never experienced. I can't relate to it, you know. And I think Ratzinger is a similar time. I just think he never lost his, the faith of his childhood. And that was said about him by Cardinal Joachim Meissner. Meissner said he's a man who is as intelligent as 12 professors, but as pious as a child on his first communion day. You know, I think that's, that's probably right. Well, I don't think there's any evidence that he wanted anyone in particular to succeed him. There's, there's certainly, um, I have heard many people say that he wanted Angelo Scola to succeed him. And certainly Angelo Scola was the heir apparent in the sense that he was the cardinal who was intellectually closest to both Pope Benedict and to St. John Paul II, which is why I said it's amazing that he wasn't using the informal do. So there's certainly a lot of rumours that he wanted Scola, but there's no proof anywhere that he wanted Scola. And I have never heard anyone say that he wanted Francis. Um, I, I mean, he... I mean, he could have, I don't know, I'm not inside the mind of the Pope, but I'm Pope Benedict, but I've never heard that said. Yeah. I mean, of course, when Francis was elected, he behaved in a gracious, um, professional manner, but, yeah. The only person I've ever heard it said that he did, in fact, hope it might succeed him was Angelo Scola, who was blocked. Scola came second in the conclave. Thanks, John. We have a round of applause for Tracy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I mentioned before the talk, um, reading some of Tracy's books and finding them very challenging. 
I hope that you understood that it's supposed to reflect on my lack of understanding and not on Tracy's uh, ability to explain things. In fact, I think what we've heard here tonight is, is uh, great proof that Tracy has, in some measure, the same gift as Pope Benedict, uh, an amazing ability to make the truth and the beauty of the Catholic faith understandable to, uh, to people. So thank you so much, Tracy, for doing that for us tonight. Um, I really encourage you to read um, Tracy's books. The ones that made the biggest impact on me were Culture and the Thomas Tradition after Vatican II, which uh, really helped me understand you know, the kind of crisis that's en enveloped the church after Vatican II and uh, the kind of uh, conflict, I guess, that's, that's gone on since then. It really made, um, made a lot of sense out of all that. And the other one was Ratzinger's Faith, where she looks at, probably in greater depth, um, which she was able to do tonight in the short time that she had it. A lot of the different contributions that um, Cardinal Ratzinger and Pope Benedict made to theology. So highly recommend those two books. And she has several others, which are also great. Um, she mentioned Pope Benedict's writings, um, some, of the, some of the most important ones. One that made a huge impact on me was Deus Caritas Est, which I, uh, which I highly recommend.